Hello everyone and back welcome back to another Teach Astronomy stream. My name is Victoria, but you can call me Vicky. And if you've been here before, you know that today, or if I guess if you saw the notification or the title, or if I got those right this time, uh, you'll know that today is book chat day. So we are going to be reading another chapter of Einstein's Monsters by Professor Chris Impey. Um, also, sorry, I, I got started a little late today. We've got a new setup, so I have a new mic here. Um, so please, hi, Adam, all together. How you doing? Um, but yeah, so please let me know if, uh, if the mic is sounding bad or anything. I was just rewatching um, one of the videos that I had done when I was putting it up on YouTube, and I noticed that my headphone mic is a little, uh, it, ha it, it uh, suffers from that like plosive sound thing uh, a little worse than I thought it did um, when you like say like your P's and B's and have like the air and it doesn't sound super nice. Um, so I thought I would use my uh, my podcasting mic and see if that was any better. Um, but let me know if the volume is not great or whatever and I can uh, mess with that a little bit. But yeah, welcome, welcome. Um, I think we've got like three people here right now. I might give it a minute or two just because... Um, Excuse me, I know there's a few other people that normally tune in, so I want to make sure we don't start. I mean, I guess we're not starting right on the dot anyway, but I um, hope everyone's weekend was good. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's getting cold here in, cold here in uh, LA, so today's a, today's a cozy Monday. Got my sweatshirt on. Uh, you can't see it, but I have a blanket down here. I am very, I'm very comfy. Uh, so I hope everyone else is comfy. Good morning, Mad Lad Science. How you doing? Um, I hope everyone's doing well and you can uh, curl up with, you know, a tea or a coffee, something warm, hot chocolate, and uh, and a blanket and a book and uh, just hang out. Well, with this book, I guess. <laughs> and me. But yeah. All right. So yeah, so uh, the next chapter that we're doing is uh, chapter four, which is gravitational engines. There she is. Oh, sorry. There she is. Oh, I'm glad your weekend was good. Yeah, mine was good. I, uh, well, we did an Among Us stream. That was fun. If you're, uh, if you're bored and looking for something to watch, we had a fun Among Us stream that's uh, archived on Twitch uh, that we did yesterday with some other... Um, another streamer and Michael was there and stuff like that. So that was a good time. And, uh, yeah, just hanging out. Um, having a good time working on a lot of Christmas presents, doing a lot of handmade Christmas presents this year. Cause I got really into embroidery. So <laughs> trying to, trying to get all that done in time, but yeah. So I guess we will, we will just go for it. We'll we'll start up and uh, see if anybody joins us. So, like I said, uh, gravitational engines um, is the next chapter. Sorry, it's working around the mic now. It's complicated. There we go. People in LA know what cold is. I'm not convinced. Well, I used to know what cold is because I did grow up in New Jersey, and like it does actually get cold there. Like we'll get to zero and stuff like pretty regularly in the in the winter. Um, but I lived in Tucson for four years or five years when I was doing my degree and then, uh, moved out here a couple of years ago. And yeah, I think I'm starting to lose a sense of what cold is. Um, it's definitely really not cold outside. It's like jacket weather outside, but the problem is like, I'm too cheap to turn on the heater in our house. <laughs> so I'm just like, I have blankets. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So... We will get started with chapter four, gravitational engines. The discovery of active galaxies transformed astronomy. Until then, the universe was thought to be made of stars and gas gathered by gravity into galaxies, and the galaxies were silently gliding apart as the universe expanded. But learning that the nuclear regions of certain galaxies pump out vast amounts of energy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum changed our understanding of galaxy structure. The discovery also raised questions. How does a supermassive black hole form and grow at the center of a galaxy? What is the evidence that gravity power can create such spectacular phenomena as quasars? 
The first answers came from a surprising direction, the center of our own galaxy. To recap, black holes are gravitational engines. They convert gravitational potential energy into radiant energy. In other words, they use matter to create light. As matter accelerates towards the event horizon, it emits high energy electromagnetic radiation. The efficiency of this process is dozens of times higher than the nuclear fusion that powers stars like the sun. Ironically, these quintessentially dark astronomical objects can be the brightest for their mass in the universe. Okay, that was the intro section. So next section is the big black hole next door. I'm like about to hit like seven keys on my keyboard. I'm just gonna, my desk is too small. It's pretty big, but it's too small, you know? Okay. Also, I'm touching the cord and stuff. I hope that's not translating into noise, but let me know if there's like some random noise, mic noise. All right. Zeus was profligate. Profligate? I never know how to say that word. I think it's profligate. Mating both with goddesses and mortals. His son Hercules was born to a mortal woman, but he let the infant breastfeed on the milk of his divine wife Hera while she slept. Hera was furious when she woke and pulled her breast from the infant's lips. The milk spilled across the sky. Hence, we call the ragged band of light marking our stellar, stellar system the Milky Way, or galaxy, after the Greek word for milk. Over 400 years ago, when Galileo pointed his primitive telescope at the gauzy light of the Milky Way, he saw it splintered into a myriad of faint stars. We know now that the Milky Way's patchiness is due to dust, which reddens and dims starlight. The dark patches aren't places where stars are absent. They're places where stars are obscured. Light traveling to us from the center of the galaxy about 27,000 light years away is almost totally blocked. Only one in a trillion photons makes it out. We might as well try to look through a closed door. Oh, no weird noises? Okay, good. Carl Jansky, the father of radio astronomy, showed in 1933 that radio emission from the Milky Way peaked in the constellation Sagittarius, which matched William Herschel's observations that that the Sagittarius housed the densest sector in our city of stars. Radio waves are unaffected by dust, but Jansky's simple radio antenna couldn't pin down the position of the radio emission very accurately. In 1974, Bruce Ballack and Robert Brown used the very long baseline interferometry method to show that the radio source at the center of our galaxy is a very small object. More recent observations reveal it to be the most compact radio source in the sky. And I have a figure for you. What figure is it? It's number 27. Hold on. There it is. So in this figure, let's see the description here. So it says, the center of the Milky Way is opaque to visible light, but radio waves can travel freely through the galaxy. This radio map shows the region within a few hundred light years of the galactic center. Brighter areas represent more intense radio emission. Some of the features identified are non-thermal radio filaments, NRFs, and supernova remnants, SNRs. At the center of the region marked SGRA, which is, uh, I believe, Sagittarius A, is the most compact radio source known, discovered by Carl Jansky in 1932. So, yeah, so like it says, this is uh, the SNR. Uh, these two are pointing towards um, supernova remnants. And then these are uh, the, those uh, non-thermal radio filaments. It's a little hard to see in this picture, especially because it's printed in black and white. And you're also watching it over a stream. Um, but I'm sure it's something you can look up. Uh, it looks like it's a, a photo from NRAO. Um but yeah, it's pretty cool. And that's uh, Sagittarius A. It is very cool. Okay. So, this source isn't like the other two sources found in earlier surveys. Sagittarius A star has similar radio brightness to Virgo A and Cygnus A, 
But Virgo A, M87, is an active elliptical galaxy at a distance of 54 million light years, while Cygnus A is a distorted galaxy, 750 million light years away. The center of the Milky Way is millions of times less powerful than those two archetypal radio galaxies, so it seems to be a different phenomenon. What kind of radio source could be so puny? In 1974, the young University of Cambridge theorist Martin Rees hinted at an answer in a... Excuse me. Oh, my gosh. Um, in 1974, the young University of Cambridge theorist Martin Rees hinted at an answer in a paper on black holes that was overlooked at the time. He argued that a massive black hole might be dark because it wasn't accreting any matter, and he was the first to suggest that it might be detected by its influence on the stars orbiting nearby. Oh, we have spam in the chat, don't we? Hold on. This always happens. Where's the block button? There we go. Great. Sorry about that. No, no, now known as Sir Martin Rees. Has, did he get knighted? I didn't know about that. That's cool. Let's see where I was. It took a while for technology to catch up with this idea. The first problem was the dust between us and the galactic center. Dust particles absorb and scatter light efficiently, but they interact far less with the longer wavelength photons. By shifting our attention from visible light at 0.5 microns to the near infrared spectrum at 2 microns, the dimming toward the galactic center drops from a factor of a trillion to a factor of 20. That's like looking through smoky glass instead of a closed door. Infrared detectors first emerged from physics labs in the 1970s, but they had just a single element, or pixel, so making an image meant tediously scanning the telescopes in a grid pattern. Like an Italian sports car, the detectors were expensive, temperamental, and prone to breakdown. By the mid-1990s, the first megapixel arrays were being used, and digital infrared astronomy matured the way optical astronomy had 15 years earlier. The second problem was the high density of stars, which caused the images to overlap and bleed into one another. Let's visualize the physical situation. There are 10 million stars within a few light years of the center of the Milky Way. That's a density of 50 million times higher than the neighborhood of the sun. If we lived there, the night sky would be spectacular. The light of a million stars would shine hundreds of times brighter than the full moon. You could read a newspaper by starlight alone. On the other hand, it would be almost impossible to do optical astronomy in such an environment. Even worse, life on any planet would be challenged. Supernova explosions would be frequent and possibly near enough to devastate biology. Frequent interaction of the stars would interfere with the solar systems, causing planets to be tossed into deep space. Comet clouds at the periphery of solar systems would be disrupted leading to impacts and mass extinctions far more often than they occur on Earth. We should be grateful to be located in a quiet suburb of the Milky Way. The convergence of two technologies, infrared detector arrays and techniques to sharpen astronomical images, suggested an exciting experiment. Make the sharpest possible infrared images of the galactic center. Find stars within a few light years of the compact radio source that move fast enough that their motions can be tracked from year to year. Then use those orbits to deduce the mass in the central region of our galaxy. A research group at the Mac Pl Mac <laughs> A research group at the Max Planck Institute near Munich was the first to attempt it. They used a 3.5 meter telescope in Chile designed specifically to make crisp images. A couple years later, a group at UCLA began the same experiment using their newly built 10 meter Keck telescope in Hawaii, the world's largest. Both groups had to fight the blurring of images by the Earth's atmosphere. If you look at a star with the telescope at an excellent astronomical site, you'll see a bright core of light randomly dancing and jittering around, surrounded by a vi... A vi Evanescent speckles of light. It was like cut in half. It's one of those words where they have to put the dash. And I, I it's like, is it evasive? Evanescent? This is what the Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded for this year. It was, yes. 
Isn't that cool? Yeah. I um actually my partner goes to UCLA and I used to work at UCLA, not in the science department or anything. I I did uh live production stuff. And um the yeah, they the UCLA team there. Uh my partner knows a couple of the professors that were part of that. So it's very cool. All right, let's see. I was at Evanescent. There we go. <laughs> The speckles are caused by rapid variations in air density and temperature in the Earth's upper atmosphere, which bend light rays, blurring and jumbling the image. A long exposure image will average the speckles, making the star appear smooth but blurred. Short exposure images freeze the atmosphere. Researchers can process, shift, and layer these images to create a much sharper image. However, the method is very tedious. Thousands of images, each exposed for a few tenths of a second, have to be analyzed and combined to make a single sharp image. After several years of following this painstaking method, the researchers isolated several dozen stars in the crowded region, which were then tracked in their elliptical orbits. Oh, we have a figure. Yeah, Professor Andrea Gez. Yes, she's so cool. All right, let me show you this next figure. That's the last one. There it is. So this says, stellar orbits around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way measured over 16 years using infrared imaging with adaptive optics to make the images extremely sharp. So these are just a bunch of orbits of stars around the Milky Way right in the middle. So it says, um, at a distance of 27,000 light years, one arc second, which is the width of the image, is 0.1 PC or four light months. This data can be used to derive a Keplerian orbit for each star and the resulting mass of the black hole is measured very reliably. That's very cool. Yeah, so this whole thing is um, one, this whole image is um, one arc second across. So this is like, these are pretty like very accurate um measurements which is pretty cool and we're back lost the button to to go from the the figure to to me for a second all right each star contributes to an estimate of the mass that's driving their collective motions both groups of researchers reach the same stunning conclusion some of the stars close to the galactic center were moving faster than 300,000 miles per hour, and the implied mass in the central few light years of the galaxy was millions of times the mass of the sun. But nothing like the corresponding amount of starlight was coming from that region. Even the hypothesis of a dense cluster of dim stars failed by orders of magnitude to account for the large central concentration of mass. The evidence pointed in just one direction, a single, compact, dark object, millions of times the mass of the sun. There was a supermassive black hole on our doorstep. And that's the end of that section. Oh, I see you put a, a photo of uh, Andrea Gaz in there. There she is. Yeah, I can show you guys. So, um, like uh, we were saying... Is Chrome going to work? Oh, I'm on a new program now, too. I'm using Streamlabs OBS now, which is very exciting. Because um, you can have little alerts. So if people follow and uh, subscribe and give bits and stuff, then there'll be a little alert thing, and it'll make a noise. And it's really fun. So if you want to do that, feel free to try it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it means that sometimes it forgets that I uh, linked things and then gets confused. There we go. Let's try that. <gasps> Amazing! <laughs> Thank you for the test. <laughs> Thank you for those bits. That's so cute. <laughs> but yeah, there's a picture of, um, of Andrea Gaz. She was one of the, I think there were three of them on the team that won um, the Nobel Prize this year for their work about uh, black holes, which is really cool. Very cool stuff. I'm not actually sure how um, how Nobel Prizes work in the way that, like, 
um i don't know if they're similar to the way where like like other awards like pop culture kind of awards work where it's like uh if this in this case if this like research was done this year if the paper was published this year then like you're only eligible for it this year i don't think so i think it's like a because i know another uh, the other winner for physics um was kind of like a lifetime achievement sort of thing because he has done like a bunch of work um on black holes and and stuff like that i think he was also a black hole scientist i can't remember we talked about this a while ago but um yeah i have to look into how that stuff works because i only really know like the how the you know the oscars eligibility and the um stuff like that emmys but uh because that's my industry i guess I guess my industry is now like streamies, but, (laughs) um, all right. So the next section is, uh, stars at the edge of the abyss. As Robert Frost wrote, quote, we dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows nature guards uh, that end quote nature guards its secrets zealously and it takes grit and determination to shed light on them. The quest to demonstrate that the Milky Way harbors a massive black hole featured one of the more intense rivalries in astronomy. On one side was Reinhard Genzel, a burly, red-haired, mustachioed man with a ruddy complexion. Genzel was the director of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching, Germany. If I'm saying that wrong, please let me know. Garching? Garching? In the pantheon of plum jobs in astronomy, Genzel had one of the best. Directors of the various Max Planck Institutes are appointed by Germany's elite scientific organization, the Max Planck Society, and they hold their jobs for life. They wield top-down and absolute power and can bring the resources of a large organization to bear on the research questions of their choice. Genzel was appointed director when he was just 34, and his group was the first to publish results on the Galactic Center and claim the presence of a dark, compact mass. That's crazy. I didn't know that they, uh, you know, they, they appointed people for life. That's like a, that's like a Supreme Court appointment in the United States, which, that's a whole other thing. Um, but yeah, at 34, imagine that. He'll have that job for at least, what, 30 years? And he gets to decide everything that's going on. That's crazy. Also, as long as Sheldon Cooper got his Nobel Prize, it's all good. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) All right. Roger Penrose rewarded the theory for the theory of black holes and Genzel and Gaz for the experimental observations of uh, Sagittarius A. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I, th- I, yeah. So I guess it's like kind of a whoever we want to honor this year sort of thing. Cause like Roger Penrose, he didn't do the theory of black holes this year, you know? Um, so I wonder how that's really decided. I would like to know. Be interesting. Anyway, where was I? Oh, speaking of, speaking of, uh, Andrea Gez, on the other side was Andrea Gez. <laughs> A New Yorker of Italian ancestry, she was four years old when she announced to her mother that she wanted to be the first woman to set foot on the moon. She became an astronomer instead, earning degrees from MIT and Caltech. She was just 29 and an assistant professor at UCLA when she observed the Galactic Center for the first time using the Keck telescope in Hawaii. She went back to Keck the following year and saw that the stars had moved in a short time. Quote, if there was a black hole, these things should move quite a lot. And in that first year, we could see very easily that the stars had moved, and we were just thrilled. I think the thrill was heightened by instrument failure at the beginning of our night. It's very difficult to get Keck time. You might only get a few nights a year. Just before the center of the galaxy set, and we wouldn't be able to see it anymore, things came together, and we got the picture. End quote. That's really cool. Sometimes in astronomy, there's a moment of discovery, and other times data has to be accumulated painstakingly over years, ascending only slowly to the level of definitive proof. In this case, 
Both research groups, led respectively by a scientist at the peak of his powers and a rapidly rising female star, knew where to look for their discovery and both knew exactly what they were looking for. Success would take perseverance and careful experimental technique. In the early 2000s, the German group moved up from a 3.5 meter telescope to the 8.2 meter Very Large Telescope, VLT, run by the European Southern Observatory in Chile. In the mid-2000s, both groups began using adaptive optics, a huge innovation that transformed modern astronomy, allowing astronomers to, quote, cheat the atmosphere and make images as sharp as the diffraction limit of the large telescope they're using. With this technique, the image blurring and distortions created by the atmosphere are rapidly compensated for by a flexible secondary mirror. Light from a powerful laser is bounced off the upper atmosphere where turbulent motions occur. Small deviations in the wave front of the light. Oh, sorry. I'm going to start that sentence over. <laughs> so light from a powerful laser is bounced off the upper atmosphere where turbulent motions occur. Small deviations in the wave front of light are measured hundreds of times a second. And corrections feed into mecha mechanical actuators attached to the back of the secondary mirror. Adaptive optics allowed scientists to apply Kepler's laws to stars observed at the center of the galaxy, which are in motion like an angry swarm of bees. One star has been tracked over its entire 16-year orbit. Astronomers have watched a star or a gas cloud get torn apart as it plunged toward the zone of strong gravity. The material eaten by the black hole probably led to a sequence of X-ray flares in 2014. Using Kepler's laws, scientists can derive the mass of the object causing their motion. The American and German groups battled to an honorable draw. Meanwhile, radio astronomers showed that the radio source was as small as the expected size of the event horizon. The mass is measured as 4.02 million times the mass of the sun, with an error of only 4%. Because these calculations are now possible, Researchers no longer need to qualify their writing with adjectives like candidate and hypothetical. The existence of a supermassive black hole has been proven beyond any reasonable doubt. And that's the end of that section. Let me put that down for a sec and take a drink of water. How's everybody doing? I see we have uh, a few people in the chat. Possibly a few other viewers that are just hanging out. Um obligatory if you are new to twitch uh feel free to make a username so you can follow us and then that little fun alert will come up um and then you can also uh talk in the chat and we can we can chit chat and hang out have a good time um also we're affiliates now so you can subscribe Ooh, very exciting <laughs> oh and there is a a fun a fun thing for subscribers that two fun things that um are new for, ooh, sorry if I just hit the mic. First one is that, uh, oh, YouTube of Gaz's Stellar Orbits. That's cool. Let's look at that. Um, of course, I get an ad. We'll uh, wait for that to go away. Ooh, very cool. I'll show you guys this while I explain. Okay, so this is a nearly 20 year time lapse it says so i guess this is what um gaz's team gaz and her team uh looked at oh it's fast but it's like right around here seems to be the center because you see that one star whip around it goes so fast it's probably like right there it's very cool. That's really cool. Thank you for that link. Oh, don't don't look at all my uh, <laughs> recommended YouTube videos. <laughs> um, Qzium said, uh, "Why do black holes look invisible? I know that light can't escape it, but why isn't it dark instead of invisible?" Well, um. I, I mean, it is dark, right? Like it's, it's, it's like 
unfathomably dark, I guess. But like it so light can't escape it, which means that light like it there's it's kind of weird, right? So like it's invisible because the vacuum of space is dark as well. You know what I mean? Um so like so since light can't escape it, all the light essentially like, once it hits the event horizon, the light is gone. At least, to, like, to us. You know, it gets sucked into this, like, singularity, which is, like, the theory of, you know, the theory of black holes that like, it gets sucked into a singularity somewhere. Like, there's this very intense point of matter where everything is, like... Like, that's why the they're... Um, like, it's an extreme, extreme density um, at the singularity. But um, it's, like invisible like yeah exactly what uh what student mcleod said like uh dark against black is essentially invisible so like since they're like that's why um i think in the last chapter they kind of talked about how uh i'm pretty sure so there's there's this thing called like gravitational lensing where if um if you have like a star pass in front of another star um if you've got like two little guys um and star pass in front of another star some of the light could get bent um because if the star is big enough uh and then you like we'd have a chance to see the other star so because of this bending of light we've been able to i'm pretty sure there's been like a black hole detected because of that bend of light because like a black hole moved in front of a star um and the star's light was bent and weird and stuff and so it bent around the the black hole so like it's it's technically like uh, it is a black hole it's like a dark star but since there's nothing behind it it's essentially invisible do you know what i mean i hope that like kind of makes sense i don't know (laughs) it's also yeah thousands upon thousands of light years away um so when it's dark and we can barely see things that are bright um it's going to look invisible. So I think I think the the terms could be interchangeable for something like a black hole just because it's um it's semantics at that point, you know. But um cuz black hole is also just like a like a colloquial term. Um Yeah, it's kind of weird. But, but yeah, it's just kind of like word choice. I think at some point, you know? All right, so. Oh, I was going to say the thing about the subscribers. So, if you are a subscriber, if you are interested in becoming a subscriber, now's the time to do it because we have two new things. Um, so, we, we already have a Discord channel for everyone, which is really fun. Um, but we now also have in that Discord channel a private channel in the channel. You know what I mean? Um, we have a private channel for, um, for subscribers where we're going to let you guys know about things a little bit earlier than everybody else, which is, excuse me, which is exciting and fun. Um, and then we also are going to be doing a fun Christmas giveaway. So, um, as you all know, Professor MP writes a lot of books. If you're here, you know that because we're reading one of them and there's many others. (laughs) Um, but he has a lot of these books in his office back in, uh, Tucson. And we thought what a fun thing it would be to, uh, do a little giveaway and, you know, pick one of our subscribers names out of a hat and send them one of Chris's books. So if you are interested, um, I don't know if I've ever really explained this before, but subscribing is only like five bucks a month. If you only want to do it for a month, see if you can get the giveaway. That's fine. Um, <laughs> and I think you get, if you, if you're new to Twitch, I th- I'm pretty sure you get 20% off your first one. So it's actually only $4 for your first month. Um, half of that goes to us, the other half goes to Amazon, which it's Amazon, whatever. Um, but it really helps us out, helps keep bringing you guys this content. Um, and then you get a chance to win a book. So very exciting. And there was something else I was going to say. Also, if you have Amazon prime, you get a free subscription. So look into that. And I think I'm going to, 
I went through the other day and like figured that all out because I know some people were confused. It's a little confusing trying to like link your Twitch and your Amazon and stuff. Um, but if you guys want help with that, I could totally help you guys do that at the end of the stream or we're also doing it um, at the end of Professor Impy's stream, which I think is Thursday this week. I need to check that, but we're going to be doing that as well because I know some people were confused. But yeah, fun new things. Anyway, we will continue. Actually, I'm going to take one more <laughs> sip of water. Student McLeod said, when John Wheeler coined the term black hole, they were also called dark stars. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think black hole just like, it's a very evocative term, you know? But yeah, black hole, a dark star, an invisible star, whatever you want to call it. Because like dark matter and dark energy are different than black holes you know and like and you could call those invisible but then also like yeah it's all semantics <laughs> it's semantics and then it's what uh the public latches onto and they decided black holes was their favorite all righty Next section is called the dark core in every galaxy. Quasars are extremely rare, a million times rarer than normal galaxies. On average, you'd need to search a volume of space a billion light years on a side to find one. As soon as active galaxies were discovered, astronomers wondered whether every galaxy goes through an active phase. A bright young theorist from England had an important insight. Donald Lyndon Bell was eclectic in his interests. He worked on fluid dynamics, ellipsoidal orbits in galaxies, negative heat capacity, and a gravitational effect called violent relaxation before turning his attention to quasars. In a prescient paper in 1969, Lyndon Bell deduced that quasars have active periods and are rarely very bright. He estimated that dead quasars should be common, and that the nearest might be less than 10 million light years away, just four times the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. He argued that these dark central masses would gather many stars around them and be detectable by their influence on those stars. I was 12 when Lyndon Bell wrote his paper, so I didn't read it until much later. But he influenced my, t my life around that time. My father and I were on a road trip in the south of England. We visited relatives in Hastings, sat on, the sh sat on the shingle beach at Brighton, then headed across the South Downs to Hertzmunds. I hope that isn't picking up. They've decided to do some landscaping outside of my window, even though there's no landscaping. It's just concrete. Um, anyway. <laughs> and then we headed across the South Downs to Hertzmunsu Castle. The castle was almost perfect, medieval, constructed of red bricks, and surrounded by a moat. But I was too old for castles. Casting around for something else to do, my father spotted a sign for the Royal Greenwich Observatory, which occupied part of the castle. There was a talk starting in half an hour. Donald Lyndon Bell paced beside the lectern, head down, deep in thought. We took our seats, and soon realized we were in way over our heads. Lyndon Bell punctuated his lecture with expansive hand gestures and moments when he talked to the blackboard and scribbled a blizzard of equations. The talk was about galaxies and black holes. Apart from the broadest of the brushstrokes, the lecture was inscrutable. I had no idea of my future path, and at times thought I might become a farmer, or an architect, or a pilot. But something about the Tweety theorist stuck a, struck a chord with me. He told me there were myriad galaxies out in space waiting to be measured. He said that these galaxies lambered, harbored dark objects that could be understood with beautiful mathematics. He projected an infectious excitement that the universe was knowable. And so, a small seed was sown. Lyndon Bell was suggesting that all massive galaxies has su have supermassive black holes at their core, and that the reason quasars are rare is that they spend only a fraction of their... Sorry missing words and that the reason quasars are rare is that they spend only a small fraction of their lives actively accreting accreting gas we see just the small fraction that are switched on most are hibernating with no food nearby 
and their pulse and life signs dialed down to very low levels. How do you find something compact, massive, and dark all at the center of a galaxy? It depends on being able to isolate a central region where the black hole dominates the gravity, the sphere of gravitational influence. Within the radius of this sphere, motions of stars and gas are driven by the black hole. Beyond this radius, motions are driven mainly by stars near the center of the galaxy. The black hole is a minor contribu contributor. For a big galaxy containing a beefy black hole 100 million times the mass of the sun, this distance is about 10 parsecs, or 33 light years. That's extremely close to the center of a galaxy 100,000 light years in diameter. If the galaxy was the size of a dinner plate, the region dominated by the black hole would be the size of a moat of dust. In a remote galaxy, it's very difficult to observe star or gas motions on this tiny scale. We can measure that the black hole at the center of our galaxy is only 27,000 light years away, 100 times closer than the center of the nearest large galaxy, Andromeda. Astronomers are able to sample stars on a scale a thousand times smaller than the gravitational sphere of influence, giving them an excellent handle on the mass of the black hole. This makes it the gold standard for massive black hole detection, verifying the existence of one beyond a reasonable doubt. But scientists were also hungry to bag hibernating black holes in galaxies other than our own. They pinned their hopes on the Hubble Space Telescope. When the telescope first launched in 1990, it was a bitter disappointment. It was built to take super sharp images from Earth orbit. And was designed to make images up to 10 times sharper than even the best ground-based telescopes that had come before it. But when the Hubble Space Telescope's first images came back, NASA officials were puzzled, and then mortified. An error in final testing in the lab had resulted in the primary mirror having spherical aberration, giving distorted images. The problem was misunderstood by the media, which accused Hubble of having a cheap, crappy mirror. In fact, it was the most precisely machined mirror in history, ground to a precisely wrong shape, because a calibrate calibration lens had been positioned incorrectly in the lab test. It took three years and a high-risk shuttle mission involving 35 hours of astronaut spacewalks to fix the problem. With the telescope restored to full health, it was able to take crisp image images of galaxy nuclei tens of millions of light years away. Why did you turn on? I didn't have my coffee this morning. <laughs> oh, a photo, photo of uh, Lyndon Bell. Thank you. You're just bringing me all these photos. Oh, he looks so sweet. <laughs> so this is Lyndon Bell. Oh my god, are you keeping me up now? <laughs> it's like 11 in the morning. I just didn't have my coffee today. like cloudy here it's kind of like a sleepy day you know what I mean but that's Lyndon Bell oh that's a cute little emote <laughs> same in Charlotte what are you guys uh what are you guys up to on Mondays I'm always curious because like I so I'm this is like my one of my jobs I guess I'm also kind of in between work uh with other stuff but I, I mainly work for like Professor MP um but what do you guys do I'm so curious I, I if you don't want to answer that's totally fine but um I'd love to know a little more about my viewers sorry I hit the mic again <laughs> let me know and if you don't want to tell me what you do tell me uh are you a coffee person or tea person what's your favorite because I don't know if I want tea or coffee after this, but I'm going to get one of them. Oh, you're a retired high school astronomy teacher. That's so cool. Oh, my God. 40 years. That's crazy. I I applaud you, man. Like, I just... I loved my teachers. I think teachers are amazing and so undervalued. I could never do it. Like, I guess, like, in 42 years in biology. Oh, my God. That's crazy. That's really cool. 
Nice. Yeah, teachers are the best. They really are. Oh, you're an astronomy grad in the UK. That's awesome. Um, actually, Professor Impey went to... I don't know if he did both of his programs in the UK. You taught over 5,000 students. That's crazy. Oh, my God. That's nuts. That's really, really cool. Thank you for doing what you do, man. That's awesome. Um, but, yeah, I think Professor Impey, I know he did his undergrad and possibly his master's at uh, Imperial College. He was just at Imperial College again uh, for... Because he was born in Edinburgh. Also, apologies if I say that wrong. I know it's... In I, I never say it quite right. <laughs> Oh, he did um, his bachelor's he did at University of London. And then his PhD he did at Edinburgh. Um, and uh, and then he just went back for to, I, I'm pretty sure Imperial College is in London as well. Um, he did a sabbatical there recently. Um, like last year. But yeah, that's so cool. I haven't traveled to, uh, yeah, it's in London. Okay. Um, I haven't traveled, unfortunately, outside of the U.S. like at all, uh, yet. I, I mean, I went to Canada once, but not even, it's like, it was like Niagara Falls, so like very close to the border of Canada and the U.S. But, um, I, I really hope to go, hopefully after all of this stuff is over, um, go and explore a little bit more. And I, I definitely want to go to the U.K. All right. Where was I? Oh, after uh, after they fixed Hubble, right? Okay. To search for black holes in nearby galaxies, the telescope is pointed so that the nucleus of the galaxy falls within the narrow slit of the spectrograph. Spectra can be extracted at different positions along the slit, corresponding to different differences, different distances from the center of the galaxy. The width of spectral features gives the average velocity of material, gas measured using emission lines if the galaxy is a spiral, stars measured, stars measured using absorption lines. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to start that sentence over because I understand it now. <laughs> the width of spectral features gives the average velocity of material, gas measured using emission lines if the galaxy is a spiral, and stars measured using absorption lines if the galaxy is an elliptical. The telltale indication of a black hole is a sharp increase in the spread of gas or star velocities very close to the center of the galaxy. We have a figure. Not that one. This one. So this is... Um, this is M84, so it says M84 is in the Virgo cluster of galaxies at a distance of 50 million light years. The image on the left shows the central region of the galaxy, which is crossed by dust lanes, and the rectangle shows where the slit of a spectrograph on the Hubble Space Telescope is placed to take the data shown on the right. So this is the bigger oop, this is the bigger picture here, and that little slit there is this. So the zigzag shows the gas velocities measured along the slit with larger horizontal displacements indicating larger velocities. If there were no black hole in M84, their trace would not have very large velocities near the center. So these are very, very high velocities, and these are less high, but still probably pretty high. Oh, and some Hubble images before and after the repair. Yeah, let's look at those. I'm trying to look at my screen around my book. Oh, yeah, you can see the huge difference. So this is... um. The original, the original Hubble, when uh, they realized there was a problem, <laughs> and then after they fixed it, I didn't realize either that it like I knew that it was a, a whole a whole thing, but I didn't know how. Um, it said it took thirty five hours of spacewalks, like that's a lot, and they said it was high risk, and that's probably that's probably why it was high risk, like because. I don't think spacewalks are the, the safest thing for astronauts to do. It's not usually a common thing. Um, you know, like the ISS 
I'm pretty sure the ISS astronauts aren't usually um, doing spacewalks and stuff like that. So thank you for that picture. All right. So the nearest big concentration of galaxies is the Virgo cluster, 60 million light years away. For a galaxy in the Virgo cluster, the angular size of the sphere of gravitational influence is 0.14 arc seconds. That's barely twice the angular resolution of the Hubble spectrograph. So looking for black holes at these distances pushed the space telescope to its limits. A decade of this slow and difficult work produced success. About two dozen black holes were detected in nearby galaxies. Our immediate neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, M31, has a 100 million solar mass black hole, surrounded by a cluster of young blue stars. We're not yet certain how they can form and survive in such an extreme environment, although this may be a general phenomenon in spiral galaxies. Andromeda's dwarf companion, M32, also has a black hole, slightly less massive than the Milky Way's, weighing in at 3.4 million solar masses within a region smaller than one light year. At the other end of the size scale is radio source Virgo A, now known as the giant elliptical galaxy M87. The black hole at the center of M87 is a true monster, 6.4 billion times the mass of the sun. Its event horizon is larger than the solar system. Black holes in the local universe vary greatly in size, spanning a factor of 2,000 in mass. Forty years after he wrote his prescient paper, Lyndon Bell stood on stage in Oslo to accept the inaugural Kavli Prize. Fittingly, the man beside him was Martin Schmidt, the discoverer of quasars. Lyndon Bell's insight about black holes was a perfect complement to Schmidt's contribution. Darkness lurks in the heart of every galaxy. All right. That is the end of that section. This is a long chapter. It's a long one. We still have 19 pages. Oh my. I'll do it for you guys, but that's a lot of reading. <laughs> I mean, it's not a lot of reading if you're just reading to yourself, you know, but it's a lot of reading when you got to say it all. But that's okay. All right. Besides, um, besides science books, I mean, I guess besides Chris's books, because there's a lot of science books that Chris, a lot of different, different topics of science books. Um, but besides like astronomy stuff, what, uh, what else do you guys like to read? I'm curious. I'm a big fan of sci-fi fantasy stuff. Um, I love the, I love the Einstein there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of sci-fi fantasy, some young adult fiction. I like that stuff too. Let me know what you guys like to read. All right. Gotta keep moving things around here. So next section is Baron Rees of Ludlow Tames the Beast. Oh, you're a Tolkienaholic? Oh, nice. Have you ever... So I haven't read any Tolkien, but I feel like um, if you've read any Patrick Rothfuss, I think they have like a similar vibe. You gave Einstein shades. Wait, how'd you do that? Oh, that's so funny. I love it. I just noticed that. I was like, is that part of the... The emote, I guess, did you use your channel points to do the, like, change a, change an emote? That's cool. But yeah, Patrick Rothfuss's series, um, I mean, <laughs> he hasn't finished it. It's three books, and he hasn't written the last one. And I don't know if he ever will. Um, but, uh, it's very, like, high fantasy. Uh, Name of the Wind is the first one. It's very good. All right. It had taken just a decade for black holes to go from being an esoteric theoretical concept to being the centerpiece of massive star evolution and the, and the explanation for activity in the nuclei of galaxies. Cambridge University was the place to be if you were a theorist. Donald Lyndon Bell got his PhD there in 1961 
and wrote his seminal paper on dead quasars in 1969. Stephen Hawking got his PhD there in 1966 and wrote his paper on radiation from black holes in 1974. Martin Rees got his PhD a year after Hawking and wrote his influential paper about supermassive black holes also in 1974. <laughs> Did you give him a little finger gun, Quizzo? <laughs> That's so cute. Having fun with the, uh, the emote. I attend Tolkien Anonymous meetings for my addiction. There is hope for me. Hey, I mean, that is probably one of the healthiest addictions you can have is an addiction to reading some good books, you know? <laughs> it was Martin Rees, not yet a lord, who put the role of supermassive black holes as gravity engines on a firm theoretical footing. To any student of cosmology, Rees is a titan. His awards are legion. The Templeton Prize, the Dirac Medal, the Newton Prize, the Bruce Medal, the Descartes Prize, Dec Descartes, the Japanese Order of the Rising Sun, and the British Order of Merit. He has been President of the Royal Society, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, Director of the Institute of Astronomy, Plumian Professor of Astronomy and Experimental Philosophy at Cambridge University, and England's Astronomer Royal. Typically modest about his professional duties, Rees characterizes the obligations of this last post as, quote, so exegist one could perform them posthumously, <laughs> end quote. So, when I first met him, I was expecting someone larger than life. In the flesh, he's a short man, with a hawk-like nose and piercing gray eyes. I actually have a picture of him. It's the figure that's going to be coming up, so I'll put it up while I, uh, while I talk about him. That's Martin Rees. He speaks so softly, you have to lean in to hear him. His voice has the lilting cadence of Schrofsfeier, where he grew up. Rees showed that accretion onto a spinning black hole can lead to twin relativistic jets and non-thermal emission across the electromagnetic spectrum, from meter-length radio waves to gamma rays with a wavelength smaller than a proton. Hello, full ass bear. Welcome. <laughs> How you doing today? I love your name. It's such a funny name. Full ass bear. <laughs> Not a half ass bear. Hi, Charlie. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Thank you for the hellos. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Active galaxies are a multi-scale phenomenon, meaning that a range of wavelengths and methods are needed to understand them. They are fascinating to theorists, but difficult to observe. Diffuse lobes of radio emission can extend several million light years from a galaxy. The fueling of the central massive black hole is governed by the host galaxy's nearby environment and gas content. On a scale of several hundred light years, there's a nuclear star formation region and a dusty torus. In the middle of the dusty torus, on a scale of light weeks to light month, on a scale of light weeks to light months, dense and fast-moving gas clouds produce broad emission lines. Even closer in, the hot accretion disk pumps out a large amount of ultraviolet and X-ray emission on a solar system scale. The emission is smoothly distributed across wavelength as a continuum. Finally, at the center of these nested Matryoshka dolls, the supermassive black hole exerts its gravitation gravitational reach over a factor of billions in scale. I'm doing good, Charlie. I hope you're doing all right. Um, we were talking before uh, about... Uh, uh, well, I mentioned it before. I don't know if anyone responded to it, but uh, just wondering uh, if people like coffee or tea and what kinds. Any recommendations? What are your favorites? Or if you're a hot chocolate kind of person. I'm just feeling real cozy. I've got my sweatshirt on. I've got a blanket down here. It's like 55 degrees here, and that's cold for me now, apparently. Fahrenheit, uh, for those who are international. It's not cold. It's really not. I've gotten too used to Los Angeles. All right. 
Rees is partially responsible for black hole accretion becoming the rarely questioned paradigm of how active galaxies work. At a conference in 1977, astrophysicist Richard McRae lampooned the tendency of astronomers, and scientists of any stripe, to be in the thrall to a, to a popular idea. He showed a diagram with simple stick figures and boundaries drawn as dotted lines, one representing the sphere of gravitational influence and the other the event horizon of a black hole. We also have a figure for this. Here it is. Let's hear his description of the cartoon and the sociology behind it. Okay, this is all in quotes. The system is characterized by two radii. Beyond the accretion radius, astrophysicists are sufficiently busy with other concerns not to be significantly influenced by this fashionable idea. But others within this radius begin a headlong plunge toward it. There's little communication among individuals as they follow random ballistic trajectories, depending on their initial conditions. In their rush to be the first, they almost always miss the central point and fly off on some tangent. With a sufficient number of astrophysicists in the vicinity of the idea, communication must occur, but it usually does so in violent collisions. The only lasting effect is that some individuals may have crossed the rationality horizon, beyond which the fashionable idea has become an article of faith. These unfortunate souls never escape. End quote. McRae's presentation was tongue-in-cheek. He was convinced by the black hole argument, but was reminding his colleagues not to leave skepticism at the door. Interesting way to, uh, to do so. Recall that by the mid-1980s, only the Milky Way showed compelling evidence for a massive black hole. In one of his paper, papers, Rees included a flowchart demonstrating the way in which gas from the intergalactic medium drizzles into galaxies and slowly finds its way to the nuclear regions. This gas, and gas jettisoned from evolved stars, feeds the formation of a nuclear star cluster, which is a dense aggregation of many thousands of stars brought together by gravity. The star cluster can't sustain itself against the gravity of so many stars, so it collapses into a large black hole, and the black hole grows by devouring gas and stars. Though he presented it as a flowchart, Rees had sound physical arguments for each step. The result gave massive black holes an air of inevitability. This is a gift of the best scientists, to take a complex argument and make it seem obvious. That's the end of that section. Oh, when people say for the coffee, please, caramel mocha. Ooh, yes, caramel mocha. That sounds very good. Um, coffee with some whole milk. You like Folgers and whatever. Very classic, classic coffee for Charlie. And then if you had to sub for hot chocolate, it would be Abuelita. Nice. Yeah, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big Starbucks fan myself, to be honest. I do like the Starbucks, like fun, like caramel latte drinks, but there's also a place, um, and I'll do coffee at home and stuff and tea at home because I used to work in a tea shop and the tea shop closed. And uh, now I have just a huge amount of tea at home. So I drink tea a lot because we got to take it home. Um, but uh, there's also a chain around here called Phil's Coffee and uh, they do excellent um, drip coffees. They've got like 15 different types of just regular drip coffee and it's so good. But Student McLeod, I see you said, uh, let's start getting excited about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction on the evening of December 21st. Oh, wow. That's going to be the close. That's crazy. Both planets could sit in a region no wider than Neil and Buzz's Sea of Tranquility. That's nuts. That's cool. That's also the December 21st is the, the winter solstice. Is that correct? I know it's around the 21st over here. Winter solstice. Are those connected? Yes, the 21st. Are those connected? I wonder. Um, I wonder if there's like a reason to that or if it just happened to land on the same day. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I have plenty of teacups and mugs if you want to come hang out and have some tea. <laughs> um, 
You just got mom some white hot, white chocolate hot cocoa. That sounds very good. Um, no connection, just coincidence. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, very cool. Yeah, that'll be that'll be very exciting. We'll have to talk about that on because uh, that's a Monday. It's a Monday before Christmas. Okay, I know I'm definitely doing book stream next week. And I'm pretty sure we're doing the other regular streams next week. But the week after, since it's the week of Christmas, and I know, like, the university has off, I'm not sure what we'll be doing. But maybe I'll do book stream that Monday anyway, and then we can talk about um, going to see going to see that, that night, that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. That'll be really cool. Not to stream it. Um, cause I definitely wouldn't get a good enough, uh, video footage for you guys from here, but, um, we'll chit chat about it. It sounds really cool though. Okay. Using quasars to probe the universe. So far, we've been focused inward, trying to understand massive black holes by looking at the effects they have on their surroundings. But it turns out that black holes can be used to diagnose an even larger dark ingredient of the universe. The technique uses quasars as intense light sources that can be seen across vast distances of space. When quasars were discovered, the redshifts indicated they were at very large distances. Two years after their discovery, the redshift record was Z equals 2, indicating light that had been traveling for 10 billion years, or 75% of the age of the universe. At the time quasars were discovered, the redshift record for a normal galaxy was only z equals 0.4, indicating light had been traveling for 33% of the age of the universe. The use of supermassive black holes as a distant light beacon opened up a new field of astronomy. Imagine a very long black box that's dark inside but has open ends. Shining narrow beams of light through the box and detecting them at the other end would reveal whether or not there was anything in the box. An obstruction would block the light completely, and even something nebulous like gas would dim the light. When astronomers used spectroscopy to spread out wavelengths of quasar light finely, they saw that the smooth light distribution was peppered with notches, where the light was missing or absorbed. The importance of this absorption absorption was first realized 200 years ago, when Joseph von Fraunhofer mapped dark, narrow lines in the sun's spectrum, and Gustav Kirchhoff showed the lines were caused by chemical elements in the sun's cool outer atmosphere. Quasar spectra have two lines of absorption, two types of... (laughs) Quasar spectra have two types of absorption lines. Absorption lines are narrow, dark regions in the spectrum where light has been absorbed by objects in the intervening space. There are lines due to elements created in stars, such as neon, carbon, magnesium, and silicon. There's also a thicket of hydrogen absorption lines at short wavelengths. After much investigation, it became clear that the first type of line is caused by chemically enriched gas in galaxy halos along the line of sight to the quasar. The hydrogen lines are due to primordial hydrogen in the vast spaces between galaxies. We have a figure. Also, random question. Um, I think I asked this the last time, but I just want to make sure. Has anyone gotten an ad that has interrupted me at all? Twitch is very confusing about um, when they put ads on. Because, like, there's a thing where it's like, if you don't run an ad for an hour, then they'll insert an ad and then it might cut me off and for this kind of thing i want to make sure it doesn't okay i like bossa nova said no ads no ads okay charlie yes (laughs) charlie said no ads student mccloud said no ads okay cool let's make sure so uh let's see so this one this figure says um quasars are at a very large are at very large distances and they act like flashlights to illuminate intervening material that may be dark and difficult to detect otherwise. Above, quasar light passes through a large galaxy and its halo and numerous small clouds of hydrogen in the intergalactic medium. So that's here. So the quasar is a distant galaxy. There's some intervening gas. 
here's Earth. So it has to pass through all that stuff for us to see it. And then below, the spectrum of the quasar is a graph of intensity versus wavelength. The large galaxy imprints absorption lines from heavy elements in the red part of the spectrum, while small hydrogen clouds imprint a forest of narrow absorption lines in the blue part of the spectrum. So here they are. So these are the absorption, hydrogen absorption lines, hydrogen emission from the quasar, and then some metal absorption lines. Very cool. Very cool, very fun figures. Very cool. <laughs> okay. Absorption line spectroscopy is sensitive to tiny amounts of gas. So dim or dark, gla dark gas clouds only 10 to 100 times the mass of the sun can be detected at distances of billions of light years. The expanding universe model gives the relationship between redshift and distance. So a spectrum, which is a map of wavelengths, is easily converted into a map of redshift or distance. Returning to the earlier analogy, the long black box is a path through the universe. Quasars are flashlights at the far end, and astronomers take spectra of those beams of light to diagnose the intervening material. Think of it as a core sample through the universe, mapping the material across cosmic time rather than geological time. Since quasars have been found with redshifts as high as z equals 7, the samples can encompass 95% of the age of the universe. Quasar absorption spectra have been used to show that there's 8 times more material in the space between galaxies than in all the stars in all the galaxies in the universe. Quasars are used as probes of the universe in another way. Let's return to light shining through the long black box of the universe. Space is mostly empty but there's a small chance that light from a distant quasar will pass directly through a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. Einstein's theory of general relativity says that light will be deflected by the mass of an intervening object. If the alignment is perfect, the quasar point source is turned into a circle of light called an Einstein ring. If the alignment is slightly off, the point source is seen as twin images. The odds of this happening are only 1%. So the phenomenon wasn't noticed until hundreds of quasars had been discovered. Since lensing is sensitive to matter that's dark as well as to visible matter, it has been used to show that dark matter is a ubiquitous component of galaxies, outweighing normal matter by a factor of six. It's an unexpected bonus that quasars are such excellent probes of the universe. The universe contains 10,000 billion billion stars and several hundred billion galaxies. I don't know what that number actually is. 10,000 billion billion. That's a lot, though. <laughs> Yet quasars have told us that there's much more mass in the spaces between galaxies, and even more mass that's dark and undetectable by any other means. All those stars and all those galaxies are just 2% of the material universe. That's, oh, sorry. And that's the end of that section. I need a little bookmark. I don't know where all my bookmarks went. They're all in other books. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I will. I will pass this on to um to Matthew. That could be cool. Um yeah, maybe I'll try to, to figure something out with him. Maybe we could uh, move our show that week to to Monday night. And uh, he could try to try to get it in the telescope. That would be fun. I will I will definitely tell him that. All right. We're going to keep on trucking. Because this is as I said, kind of a longer uh, longer chapter, so all right. Weighing black holes by the thousand. Let's continue our story of quasar discovery. Spectroscopy is required to reveal and to understand quasars. An optical spectrum is used to measure redshift, which can be used to calculate luminosity. A high quality spectrum can be used to measure black hole mass. But progress was slow. 
Large telescopes could only take spectra of one candidate at a time. Through the 1960s and 1970s, the number of known quasars crept up from a few dozen to a few hundred. The first breakthrough involved telescopes with special optics to make images of large swaths of sky. The Wide Field Schmidt Telescope at the Palomar Observatory was completed in 1948, and during the 1950s it was used to survey the entire northern sky in two colors, with nearly 2,000 photographic plates. Each plate covers 36 square degrees, about the size of your closed fist held at arm's length. The survey was funded by the National Geographic Society as a cosmic extension of their goal of mapping the world. A twin of the Palomar Schmidt was built in Australia, and it surveyed the southern sky during the 1970s. Each image included a million galaxies and 10,000 quasars and active galaxies. Finding the 1% of galaxies... Oh my gosh, I keep yawning. Oh, sorry. I like think about yawning, and then I can't not do it. It's not even that I'm tired. I've been up for like two hours. <laughs> Okay. Finding the 1% of galaxies with nuclear activity required additional information. Optical designers developed a large prism that could be placed in the optical path of a Schmidt telescope. The prism smeared each faint source of light into a tiny spectrum on the photographic plate. Quasars have strong and broad emission lines. It was hoped that they would stand out because the emission line would appear as a blob on the top of the streak. And we have a figure. Oh, oh. No, no, there it is. So this is, um, so this says multiple spectra can be taken by putting a large prism in the optical path of a telescope so that there is a direct image of each object, the dots, and a spectrum to the right, the horizontal streaks. Most of the objects in any field of view are stars or galaxies with smooth and featureless spectra at this low resolution but rare quasars stand out because they have strong, broad emission lines that look like blobs on top of the streak. The quasar 3C273 is near the center of this photographic image. So it's a little hard to see just because, you know, stream and... This is... Oh my gosh. Sorry. That this is printed in a book. Um, my kingdom for some tea. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a little hard to see just because, again, like... This is over stream, but essentially every one of these dots has a corresponding line that is the emission line. And some of them, and it's one of the ones in the center, but I'm not actually sure which one. It might be this one or this one. Um, but some of them that are quasars um, have little blobs that, again, it's, this is, it's really tough because the resolution in this book is just not high enough, I think, to really display this. But some of them have little blobs. I guess you can see it in this one, I think. Um, or that one. Where uh, you can see uh, the really strong emission lines. And that's uh, and those are like quasars. Quasar emission lines. Yeah. All right. It required great expertise to find quasars by eye. But machines were developed to scan and digitize the plates and look for quasars using algorithms to sift them from the much more numerous stars and galaxies. I got my feet wet with quasar hunting using this method. The place was... Oh, sorry. I want to pronounce it right. The place was Coonabarabran in the Warrumbungle Mountains of New South Wales, Australia. That sleepy town on the edge of the outback is the home base of the UK Schmidt Telescope. Oh, gosh. The Southern Hemisphere twin of the Palomar Schmidt. I was sent there as a graduate student at Edinburgh, Edinburgh University to help with photographic prism survey. It wasn't exactly a hardship to go from the gloomy Scottish winter to the hot Australian summer. Within a few days of arriving, I'd been trained in the darkroom, and I was observing all night and developing the photographic plates before going to bed. The plates were 14 inches on a side, a millimeter thick, and very tricky to handle in the dark. After all this time, it still pains me to admit that I broke more than a few, wasting hours of telescope time. 
Occasionally, I was literally pained by the razor-sharp edges, adding drops of my blood to the developer or the fixer fluid. When the sky was clear and the plate was well exposed, it was worth the effort. Each plate was a negative with a pale gray background and thousands of small dark streaks representing the spectra. I'd sleep until lunch and in the afternoon mount the plates in a light box and scan them with a microscope. My elusive quarry was a streak with a blob at the blue end, looking like a tadpole. The blob was the hydrogen emission line that would distinguish a quasar from a hot star. I remember the jolt of excitement when I found my first quasar. And it didn't fade after finding dozens, though my vision started to blur after hours staring through the microscope. Each of these little tadpoles was a massive black hole billions of light years away, pouring a torrent of rain into the universe. Of radiation. I don't know why I read rain. <laughs> pouring a torrent of radiation into the universe. After bagging my hundredth quasar, I went for a celebratory hike in the local mountains, bushwhacking through wild terrain. At dinner, the local astronomers gave me a royal ribbing, reminding me that Australia has three of the five most venomous spiders in the world, and four of the five most venomous snakes. The second breakthrough took place in the 1990s, when photographic plates were replaced with large-format electro electronic detectors, or CCDs. Using fibers or slits, the light from hundreds of targets is gathered and projected onto the CCD. Large telescopes now have spectrographs that can cover a square degree or more, several times the area of the full moon. The preeminent quasar hunting tool is the 2.5 meter telescope doing the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The telescope wouldn't make a list of the top 50 te largest telescopes in the world, and of course the Hubble Space Telescope wouldn't either, but it's, but it's exquisite spectrograph and CCDs give it an extraordinary grasp of light. It has measured redshifts for 2 million galaxies and 500,000 quasars. And I will show you a figure for that. Is that the figure? Wait, where'd the figure go? Hold on. Oh, there it is. I passed right by it. So this says the Sloan Digital Sky Survey used a 2.5 meter telescope in New Mexico and an efficient multi-object spectrograph to measure the redshifts of an unprecedented number of galaxies and quasars. The BOSS, um, Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, observed 500,000 galaxies and 100,000 quasars, a small fraction of which are shown in this pie chart of the sky. Redshift or distance increases radially. Galaxies are dots at redshifts less than one, less than one, and quasars are dots from redshift 1.5 out to 3. So, it looks like these are our galaxies here, and then our quasars are around here. Very cool. Alright. Crucially, those digital spectra are much better than the little streaks I used in the 1970s to discover quasars. Spectra from the Sloan survey are high enough quality to, to allow a measurement of a black hole's mass. We've seen how difficult it is to weigh a supermassive black hole. The closest one at the center of our own galaxy was weighed accurately using individual stars that loop around it on elliptical orbits. A second precise measurement of black hole mass was made in 1995 when radio astronomers discovered water masers, long wavelength versions of lasers, produced when conditions naturally occur for a gas, in this case water molecules, to emit intense and pure radiation, orbiting in a thin disk at the center of the nearby active galaxy NGC 4258. Other galaxies, too, show maser emission from water molecules in their dense nuclear regions and the resulting spectral lines allow the maser's velocities to be very accurately measured by radio methods. In NGC 4258, the positions and velocities of the masers match Kepler's laws of motion, implying a central mass of 3.82 million times the mass of the Sun, with an error of only 0.3%. Maser emission extends to less than a light year from the center of the galaxy, or a thousand times smaller than the sphere of gravitational influence. So large mass is concentrated in a region that would normally only contain a few hundred stars. 
a black hole is the only viable interpretation. Maser emission is rare, so this observation proved hard to replicate, but it may soon be possible using interferometry at millimeter wavelengths. The quiescent black holes of galaxies in our cosmic neighborhood can be weighed using the motion of gas or stars near the nucleus, but several decades of this work have yielded masses for just 70 black holes. Extending these measurements beyond the Virgo cluster, which is about 60 million light years away, is impossible using current techniques. Just gonna take a take a water break there. This is a very long section. Please don't close. Okay. Oh, and there's a photo of Sloan, yeah. Oh, nope, this PowerPoint. There we go. There's Sloan. That's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope. All right. And we're back. Of course, Charlie, thank you for being here. I'm just glad people enjoy this. It's really fun. Oh my God, I have blue on my mouth now. Oh no. <laughs> so um, I was using the same water bottle yesterday when we were playing Among Us and I had blue lipstick on. Um, so my water bottle, I don't know if you can see that, but it is now blue and I didn't think it was coming off, but I guess it is. <laughs> That's what I get for being cyan in Among Us. All right. Just ignore that. Just pretend it's not there. It's fine. It's okay. All right. Quasars, as we've seen, have supermassive black holes that act as gravity engines by converting the mass that falls into intense radiation. Why not use the brightness to infer the black hole mass? It's a good idea, but it doesn't work in practice. Far from being flashlights with a standard brightness, the brightness of quasars ranges by a factor of thousands from one quasar to the next. For a particular black hole mass, the brightness depends on the efficiency of accretion the black hole spin rate, and the amount of gas and dust in the central regions. Unfortunately, quasar power is a poor guide to black hole mass. Oh, a photo of the Virgo cluster. <laughs> Amazing. Here's a picture of the Virgo cluster. So this is the one that's um, 60 million light years away. Beautiful. Student McLeod over here doing the work. Getting me all the photos. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Just when it seemed as if astronomers had reached the end of the road, they came up with a clever method to infer black hole mass in nearby active galaxies. It uses one of the signature features of quasars, their broad emission lines. The hot gas producing these emission lines is within a light year of the central object, so its motion is dominated by the black hole. The gas in this region should obey a simple equation. Oh boy, another equation that I have to explain. So M subscript BH is approximately equivalent to RV squared divided by G, where G is the gravitational constant and V is the velocity of the gas. I hope that makes sense. Everyone needs a wing person. Poor Goose was Mavericks. Oh, <laughs> that's very funny. Okay, so the same equation could give us the mass of the sun if we knew the velocity and distance of an orbiting planet. In the case of a black hole, the velocity of the orbiting gas is easily derived from the width of the emission lines. That just leaves R the size of the region producing the broad emission lines, as an unknown quantity. Various physical arguments suggest the region is about 0.01 parsecs, or 10 light days across, 10 times larger than the solar system. And we have a figure. Is this the figure? I guess so. Yeah, 
that's the right one so it says um a schematic cross-section of the inner region of an active galaxy or quasar shows the ingredients that can be used to measure the mass of the central supermassive black hole so when light from the central engine varies gas clouds in the broad line region respond with a time delay of 10 to 100 light days the velocity of these those clouds is measured by the width of their spectral lines as a result the mass of the black hole that drives the motions can be estimated the technique is called reverberation mapping That's how they measure black holes. This is far too small to be resolved by any telescope for most galaxies. So how can it be measured? The clever method makes use of the fact that the light intensity from quasars and active galaxies varies with time. Let's visualize the situation. The accretion disk that generates the enormous brightness of quasar is so small that we can consider it a point source of light. The brightness varies on timescales of days, which was one of the original arguments for supermassive black holes, since the source could be no bigger than the light travel time across it. The logic of this argument is that if the light variations arise from a single object, more rapid variations imply a smaller object. Light from the central point source travels out and hits the fast-moving gas that causes emission lines. This gas responds, or reverberates, to the varying point source with a delay, t, given by the light travel time across the gas, t equals r divided by c, where c is the speed of light. It's called reverberation mapping because we're mapping the way light from the point source results in echoes from the gas. The time it takes the echoes to arrive gives the size of the region of hot gas. The required observations are simple, but tedious. An observing campaign is set up, with telescopes around the world measuring spectra for a sample of quasars or active galaxies. Having a handful of telescopes around the world gives 24-hour coverage of the variation and ensures data even if one or two sites are clouded out. Spectra are gathered over week-long observing runs scattered throughout the year. So all timescales from days to months are sampled. The emission line gas responds to the radiation from the black hole with a time delay due to light travel time. The time delay gives the size of the broad line region, which in turn gives the mass of the black hole. Thus, reverberation mapping relies on time resolution rather than spatial resolution. The method was first applied to NGC 5548, one of Seyfert's original active galaxies. Its central black hole is 65 million times the mass of the sun, with an uncertainty of 4%. Intensive monitoring campaigns with small telescopes have yielded 60 black hole masses for nearby active galaxies. The research shows that more powerful active galaxies have larger regions of fast-moving gas. This is where it gets fun. The painstaking reverberation mapping work shows how the size of the emission region relates to the luminosity of the active galaxy. Now, rather than carrying out a long-term monitoring campaign involving hundreds or thousands of measurements for an active galaxy of interest, a single spectrum can be used for an estimate of the black hole mass. The emission line width gives V, and the luminosity gives R, which is all that's needed in the equation M subscript BH is approximately RV squared divided by G. Black hole masses from single spectra are uncertain by a factor of 3, or 300%, which isn't great. But it's adequate for statistical work. Rather than spending months of observation to acquire a single black hole mass, you can bag 100 black hole masses in a single night. Tens of thousands of masses have been published. Astronomers are harvesting massive black holes on an industrial scale. And that's the end of that section. All right, and it looks like we've got... Just three more sections left to go. And I think this also is the end of this like section of the book, so. We should finish right around on time. So we'll keep on going. Accretion power in the cosmos. 
Matter falls onto a black hole and it heats up. Also, the rotation energy of the spinning black hole accelerates particles, which then emit radiation. This process is extremely efficient. If we define efficiency as the energy output divided by the mass energy of all the input ingredients, accretion onto a black hole is about 10% efficient, compared to 1% for nuclear fission or fusion, and 10 to the negative 7% for chemical energy. Matter can liberate 10% of its mass energy as photons just by falling. How much mass does it take to turn a supermassive black hole into a quasar? Not very much. For a black hole of 100 million solar masses to generate a quasar-like power of 10 to the 39 watts and an efficiency of 10%, only one solar mass per year has to be accreted. Think of it. Snacking on just one star per year can keep a black hole shining brighter than an entire galaxy of stars. As John Updike said, there is still enough energy in one overlooked star to power all the heavens madmen have ever proposed. But feeding a black hole is a challenge, because the radiation produced by a quasar exerts a pressure that drives matter away from the central source. It's analogous to the phenomenon of radiation pressure making a comet tail point away from the sun. The inward gravity force of a supermassive black hole must exceed the outward radiation pressure for matter to be accreted. It took a long time for astronomers to get a complete picture of accretion power in active galaxies. That's because physical processes close to black holes spread energy across an enormous range of wavelengths. For example, the archetypal quasar 3C273 has been detected at frequencies ranging from 10 to the 8th hertz to 10 to the to 10 to the 24th hertz. I think it's hertz. I just realized I was just assuming it was hertz. I think it is. HC. Yeah. Wavelengths ranging from over a factor of 10,000 trillion, from radio waves 3 meters long to gamma rays one-third the size of a proton. And we have a figure. Here it is. So um, this is the energy distribution of the brightest qua bright quasar 3C273 across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see the... Um, Yeah, the very long uh, radio wavelengths are down on this end. And then the very, very short ones are over here. It says the vertical axis is energy. And the, so over here. And the horizontal axis is frequency. Um, stars in normal galaxies only emit a narrow range of optical and infrared wavelength. So such a broad range of energy, energy indicates gravity, energy, and particle acceleration close to a supermassive black hole. Very cool. All right. Oh, I lost my place. There it is, okay. However, the only wavelengths from that vast range that can be detected at ground-based observatories are a broad swath of radio waves and a narrow slice from near infrared through optical wavelengths. The rest require specialized satellites in Earth orbit. Viewing the universe using just one part of the electromagnetic spectrum leads to incomplete information, the elephant problem. Full accounting of accretion power means that we have to consider the whole elephant. The radio emission that first drew attention to active galaxies in the 1950s turns out to be a very small fraction of the total power of a quasar. This emission is from relativistic electrons near the black hole and in twin jets. Let's call it the tail of the elephant. The next most important contribution is high energy X-ray emission, which also comes from, a relativist, from relativistic electrons. Let's call that the elephant's trunk. Even more important is infrared radiation from cool dust farther away from the black hole, at temperatures ranging from one, 10 to 100 Kelvin. The dust is the elephant's leg. The dominant contributor to quasar power is the accretion disk, very close to the black hole. It has a temperature of roughly 100,000 Kelvin and puts out most of its energy at ultraviolet and X-ray wavelengths. This is the bulk of the elephant, its body. Active galaxies were first discovered by their radio emission because they stand out in the generally quiet radio sky. 
But within a few years, astronomers realized that the most attractive gal... Not attractive. Active. (laughs) But within a few years, astronomers realized that the most active galaxies have such weak radio emission that they're invisible to radio searches. Ten times as many are found in optical surveys as in radio surveys. Then, in the 1980s, X-ray astronomers were puzzling over a weak X-ray signal that could be seen all over the sky. They assumed it was the sum of many distant sources that were too weak to be detected individually. But, when they added up the expected X-ray, X-ray radiation from the existing optical samples of active galaxies, it fell short of the X-ray background by a factor of 10. The puzzle isn't completely solved, but it's now clear that the X-ray background is due to active galaxies that are missing from optical surveys. They've been rendered invisible by dust. The presence of dust can radically change the energy distribution of an active galaxy by reprocessing optical emission into infrared emission. Dust doesn't affect affect X-ray photons, so the clearest and most complete view of the population of active galaxies comes from X-ray surveys. And that's the end of that section. Oh no, I dropped the mic. I'm so sorry. So sorry if that was loud. I have a very precarious setup here. I really want to get um, one of those microphones that like attaches to the wall and like comes down. You guys can't see what I'm doing, but like there's the like hang, and then it could be like here or something. A lot of podcasters and streamers have stuff like that, and I don't know if I uh, am enough of a streamer to do that. But I also have a podcast, and it would help very much with uh, with that because then it's just out of your way, you know. Can use more of your desk. I also want to do something more creative with my white wall behind me because it's so exciting and fun. Do you guys have any suggestions on what to do? I'm going to paint. Um, I live in an apartment, so don't tell my landlord, but I'm going to paint. Um, I'm going to do like half the wall. I'm going to leave the top half white and then a middle section that's like this thick of one color. And then the bottom is going to be a whole other color. Don't know what colors yet. We will see. Okay. Massive black holes are not scary. (laughs) Are you sure Dr. Infy will buy that mic for you? I mean, that would be very nice, wouldn't it? Um, I'll have to see. Again, we're short on that grant money, so... (laughs) I'm, uh, between, between Twitch stuff and my podcast, um, we'll see if I can, if I can get enough money to get myself a nicer mic. All right. Massive black holes are not scary. Let's alleviate the fear factor associated with black holes. Black holes are not like cosmic vacuum cleaners, sucking in everything around them. Black holes do have a sphere of gravitational influence, like any object with mass. But if the sun were to suddenly condense to a black hole, the gravity at the distance of the Earth would remain unchanged, and the Earth would continue unperturbed in its orbit. Although humans would be very perturbed by the loss of the sun's light and energy eight minutes later. Second, we're not in imminent danger of encountering a black hole. A tiny fraction of stars die as black holes, and there are no black holes in the neighborhood of the sun. The nearest stellar black hole is V616. Mon. It's roughly 10 times the sun's mass and 3,000 light years away. The next closest is the prototypical Cygnus X1, 15 times the mass of the sun and at a distance of 6,100 light years. However, we won't have the technology to visit a black hole, even using miniaturized space probes for many decades. So any discussions about humans falling in is hypothetical. The nearest massive black hole is 4 million times the mass of the Sun, at the center of our Milky Way, 27,000 light years away. The nearest supermassive black hole is at the center of the giant elliptical galaxy M87, 60 million light years away in the Virgo cluster. This monster tips the scales at a hefty 5 billion times the mass of the Sun. However, massive black holes aren't as extreme as you might think. The formula for the Schwarzschild radius, which defines the event horizon, is R subscript S equals GM divided by C squared. 
So the size of the event horizon is proportional to mass. It's 300 million kilometers, or twice the Earth-Sun distance, for a quasar black hole 100 million times more massive than the Sun. Size increasing linearly with mass means that density within the event horizon decreases according to the square of the mass. The stellar black hole three times the mass of the Sun has a density 10,000 trillion times the density of water, while the black hole at the, at the galactic center has a density only 1,000 times higher than water. A quasar black hole 100 million times the Sun's mass has a density only 10% of that of water, and the largest black holes have densities 10,000 times lower still. How scary is a black hole when it's less dense than the air we breathe? Let's think about that for a minute. If you took space the size of the solar system and filled it with air, it would be a black hole. And if you could make an ocean big enough, that black hole would be buoyant and rise like a bubble. Crossing the event horizon of a massive black hole would likely be much less dangerous than entering a stellar black hole. For one thing, spaghettification would be far less likely. The acceleration due to stretching force declines rapidly as the mass of the com compact object increases. At the event horizon of a 100 million solar mass black hole, that acceleration would be orders of magnitude less than the Earth's gravitational acceleration. An intrepid voyager would cross the event horizon without feeling a thing. Oh, and you have the location of Cygnus X1? Thank you. There she is. This also reminded me of, um, you know what, we're going to go on a fun little tangent adventure. There's a place in New Jersey uh, called Wildwood where my family uh, vacations. And they have a boardwalk. And they have rides on that boardwalk. And Cygnus X1 is a ride on that boardwalk. So this is, uh, this is <laughs> where real Cygnus X1 is. But growing up, this is where I thought Cygnus X1 was on the boardwalk. <laughs> it's one of those, um, those rides where they spin you really fast on the inside and you feel like you're floating. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was funny. I thought it was a really clever little naming scheme once I figured out what Cygnus X1 was. All right. There we are. This suggests the ultimate adventure for a space traveler of the far future. Find yourself a black hole. Anything bigger than a thousand times the mass of the sun will do. Gather your friends and family and position them in a spaceship at a safe distance. They will think of this as your final farewell, since nobody can escape a black hole. And put your spaceship on a free fall course towards the event horizon. As you approach the event horizon, give a casual wave. Your friends will see your image stretched and distorted. It will also redden as photons struggle to escape the intense gravity of the black hole. You'll see and feel nothing, nothing unusual as you pass through the event horizon to an intriguing but unknown fate. Friends and family will be treated to a final tableau of you with your hand poised in mid-wave, the image fading to red and frozen for eternity. That's like, you know, Chris phrases that nicely. But it also sounds kind of horrific. You know, I'm glad it's all I'm going to say is I'm glad it's all theoretical. <laughs> oh, and you have an illustration of spaghettification. That's fun. So, um, yeah, so the, uh, what Chris was just describing was not spaghettification because that wouldn't happen with certain, with these larger mass black holes, which is very interesting. But the smaller ones, um, as we've talked about before, uh, would spaghettify you like a this. Um, so it would stretch you because the gravity force was so different between like where one side of your body was and the other side um, because gravity intensifies so quickly. Um, there, can you play it? No, you can't. Um, so it would just, just rip you in half. <laughs> I'm so funny and bright. Oh, thank you. 
I'm glad you enjoy my my low quirky personality. <laughs> All right, so we have just one extra little section. It seems like the conclusion of part A, and then we'll be wrapping up. It would ruin a person's whole day to be spaghettified. I think I think you're right there. <laughs> it would not be it would not be a fun afternoon. All right. Let's review the road we have traveled. Although some early scientists dreamed of black holes, it took a bold new theory of gravity to predict them. Their properties are so bizarre that even the architect of the theory, Albert Einstein, didn't believe such monsters existed. Physicists were energized by the idea of black holes, and they redoubled their efforts to reconcile the theories of gravity and the quantum world. At that point, it was up to the observers. Not everything we can dream and scheme and calculate is real. Black holes form whenever a massive star dies, but they're invisible to the eye, so they can can only be seen when they orbit a visible star. After several decades of painstaking work, several dozen binaries were found, in which the dark member of the system was so massive that it had to be a black hole. The observations were convincing. Theorists who had bet against the existence of black holes paid up. Meanwhile, astronomers were accumulating evidence that galaxies are more than just large assemblages of stars. The centers of some galaxies contain swirling hot gas and sources of intense radio and x-ray emission that can outshine the entire galaxy and be seen across most of the universe. The radiation is powered by gravity from black holes millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. It's an irony of astrophysics that something so dark can lead to so much light. Our own galaxy harbors a massive black hole, dark because it's slumbering between meals, diagnosed by a swarm of stars that orbit it at millions of miles per hour. Theorists predicted that all galaxies should harbor massive black holes. With the help of tools like the Hubble Space Telescope, astronomers confirmed the prediction, locating black holes that were inactive and dark, and others that were voraciously consuming gas and shining brightly. They've weighed black holes by the thousand, This research has taken away black holes shock and awe and given them an air of inevitability, which doesn't make them any less amazing. Now it's time to explore the implications of black holes. We'll look at their life story and their role in the evolving universe going back to the Big Bang. We'll learn how they can be simulated in a computer and ask whether or not they could ever be created in a lab. We'll see how they can be used to test our theory of gravity and how we've detected the ripples in space-time that result when they merge. Finally, we'll look at the fate of black holes over near-infinite spans of cosmic time. And that is the end of part A. So look forward to all of that in part B. Oh, much more enjoyable to eat a spaghetti parm. Yes, you are correct. I would definitely rather have some good spaghetti than uh, be (laughs) spaghettified. Well, that was fun. That was a fun section to read today. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. Enjoy my nap. (laughs) I'm going to go have some lunch now and then I'm going to get myself some coffee because I got some other stuff to do today. We've got another, um, I think we're going to be doing, and I've got to work on a video for Active Galactic. If you guys don't know what that is, it's the uh, YouTube channel that I originally started working on for Professor Impey. And then we have, you know, done a bunch of other stuff, but uh, it's still around. And we do like uh, videos on like very zeroed in topics. And I think we're going to do one about uh, the Arecibo collapse for this month. So we've got to go edit that because that comes out in like two weeks. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in that, you guys can go check us out on YouTube. But I think that's about it for today. Thank you guys all for hanging out. This was fun. We had, I had a good time. I hope you guys did too. Oh, I, I will tell him thank you. (laughs) That's very sweet of you to say. Um, there is a video on YouTube of it collapsing. Yeah, I'm probably going to use that in, uh, in the the video so that and some other stuff that uh professor mp said on his last q a but yeah um as far as wrapping up stuff uh regular housekeeping stuff wednesday we have a 
It's not going to be a news stream unless something crazy happens. Um, I say that and then I feel like I should knock on wood or something. <laughs> uh, but it's not going to be a news stream this Wednesday. We're probably going to focus on some interesting topic or maybe find an expert. Um, if you guys have any suggestions for topics, feel free to put them in here or in the Discord. If you guys are part of the Discord, you can throw them in the um, the Twitch streams uh, chat if you got any suggestions there. And then Friday we have Amateur Astronomy and we actually have a guest on Amateur Astronomy. So that will be really fun. Um, Mike, uh, Matthew's bringing his friend who I believe he does, um, a lot of astrophotography. I think he's an astrophotographer. So that'll be fun. And, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, please, if you haven't already, uh, please follow us and, uh, you'll get notifications for when we go live and stuff like that. Also, um, you know, as I've said, uh, we're affiliates now, so you can subscribe if you want to. Um, also, you can subscribe if you have Prime. Everyone gets one free Prime subscription. You just have to link your your accounts. And if you don't know how to do that, we're going to be doing an explanation video on Chris, at the end of Chris's next live stream, which I believe is this Thursday. That will be on um, the schedule. I'll be able to put that on the schedule later today. And I think that's pretty much it so thank you guys all for coming out thank you for your kind words uh charlie and uh and jim really appreciate it and adam thanks for hanging out i like your little <laughs> for science all right and i will uh i will see you guys on wednesday so have a good one